I'm serious. I'm calling upon you, and we need you. And so I would encourage you, if you've not been doing that, uh, please do so uh, on Tuesday. We've got a Soul Sisters event coming up this coming Friday, October the 23rd at 6.30. And it's going to be right out there at the pavilion and around the, uh, the new fire pit, uh, which, by the way, thank you, Matt, for putting that together. How many of you were at the picnic last night? Oh, my goodness, that's what I thought. Did you guys see that nice fire pit? Yeah, you guys can thank Matt for that after service. He built, he did a great job and got rid of what was there and rebuilt it up and did a fantastic job. And I saw a whole bunch of you sitting around the fire last night. Ladies, this coming Friday night at 630, uh, you're going to be out there at the pavilion. If you have any questions, uh, you, anything like that, uh, please make sure and see my wife. You can see uh, the, the details there in your bulletin uh, in front of you. Next Sunday evening, uh, Brother Tim Throckmort is going to be here with Family Research Council, and next Sunday night at 6 o'clock, and uh, so you're going to get to hear uh, what, what God is doing, and uh, he's going to be admonishing us and instructing us and helping us as we pray and as we look at our nation, what God wants to do and what he's able to do. So I want you to be here. It's going to be a great uh, time of being together like and, uh, and hearing what God uh, wants to do and can do in our nation with with Christians, people that are praying and seeking the face and mind of the Lord. So you want to be here uh, this uh, coming uh, week from today at 6 o'clock. And then next Wednesday night, October the 28th, right here uh, at the Family Ministries building, rather, at 6 p.m., uh, we're going to have our annual trunk or treat. And uh, I'm, I'm sorry, weather permitting, it'll be right here in the parking lot. If not, we'll be up in the Family Ministries building. Uh, but we will be eating up there uh, later. Uh, sno snoops. Snacks and soups. <laughs> bring your snoops and uh, shorthand, however you want to look at it. And uh, bring what you have. We'll add water to it if we run low. And uh, we'll have a good time together. Check your bulletin there for those announcements. Uh, make sure you bring a drink and, uh, and decorate your, your back of your vehicle. And uh, last year, I think we had to move it inside the gymnasium because it was so cold and windy. If we have to do that again, we will. Uh, but this is a church event, all right? Uh, the whole point is to provide a safe environment for our kids and our families. I don't know if you've been paying attention. Uh, but it's kind of an unsafe thing going around. And we want to come together as a church and provide this opportunity. And we always have a lot of adults that show up and participate as well. So make sure you do that. We're going to have a pumpkin painting activity for everyone. Uh, bring, make sure you bring your own pumpkin and paint and brushes will be provided. And then in just a couple of weeks, uh, 65th church anniversary on Sunday, November the 1st. And you can see those details in the bulletin. We've got some guests, uh, some guests that are coming in, former pastors, and then maybe some family of those. Uh, former pastors that have passed away, uh, but looking forward to a great time together. Uh, we're going to have lunch, and we're going to have the Sankey family, and then the Stetler Trio are going to be here at 2.30 in the afternoon for singing, and a great day, a great day of remembering what God has done and yet looking forward to what God wants to do, and I'm looking forward to that day, and I hope that you are as well. Those are our announcements today, and again, it's a joy and privilege to have you with us worshiping the Lord in God's house. Why don't you stand with me, and let's open with a word of prayer, and then remain standing as Aaron leads us in singing. Lord Jesus, we thank you today that you're already here, that you're everywhere at all times, at all places, and that you've come this morning to meet the needs of our hearts. You see every individual, you know every family unit, Lord, you know the struggles, maybe even of this day already. And yet, Lord, you've, you're here and you're calling us to set aside all of those things and worship you, our Redeemer, our friend, and our soon coming King. So, Lord, if at all possible, would you help each of us to put aside the disappointments of yesterday, the demands of tomorrow, and get our eyes up on the author and finisher of our faith, Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, today and forever. Bless your people, we pray. And Father, may you be exalted and lifted up. In Jesus' name, amen. I want to ask you to join me on this chorus this morning. Praise the name of Jesus. And that what we're here for this morning to lift up his name in praise. Let's do it together. Praise the name of
When darkness seems to hide his face, I rest on his unchanging grace. In every high and stormy gale, my anger holds within the veil. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other Turn to song number 572. 572. I'm thankful that he's our rock.
this morning. Sometimes I think we sing these hymns and we've kind of lost the real significance and meaning of the words. A wonderful Savior is Jesus my Lord. He taketh my burden away. He holdeth me up and I shall not be moved. He giveth me strength as my day. Oh, he hideth my soul in the cleft of the rock that shadows a dry, thirsty land. He hideth my soul in the depths of his love, and he covers me there with his hand. Friend, I want you to know something this morning. If you can't stand on your own, he holds you up, and he removes your burden. Every now and again, he shows himself strong and mighty and able to deliver, and in those moments, we ought to give him praise. (laughs) That he hides us, he covers us, and we cannot be moved when we're in the palm of his hand. What a wonderful, wonderful Savior is he this morning. Anybody want to give God praise today? You just want to exalt the name of Jesus. Anybody like that? Mary? I uh, I don't know if people know, but I have a little part-time job at the Board of Elections. uh, So, I mean, it's not hard work, but it's long hours. And um, this week, um, and most everybody curses. Most everybody does different things, and... Uh, this week we had a lady, she's not, anyway, she's not the kind of person you want to be around a lot. And we were in the break room and, and the ladies were talking about her and I didn't say anything. Well, I just said, you know, maybe she has problems we just don't know about. And so I went home and I prayed about that. And the Lord reminded me, you, sh- you didn't really say anything, you should have just walked away. You know, because you shouldn't participate in that. So I went back the next day and told him I was very sorry just reading and listening. Because she wasn't there to defend herself and everything. This Catholic lady said, you know, I thought about what you said after that. She said, you didn't say anything wrong. You said that she wasn't, you know, that we um, shouldn't talk about her and all this stuff. And she said, it really helped me. And I said, well, you know, I said, people have a lot of situations they don't know about. And asked the Lord to really help me. She said, you don't owe me an apology. And I said, yes, I did, because I sat here and I heard you say what you said. And I said, that's not the kind of person I want to be. And um, I said, uh, I want to be the kind of person that people look at me and see Christ. Mm -hmm. And we were, uh, and they moved me to another place to help with different things. And I asked this guy, I said, why am I in in here? And he said, because your boss said you're dependable. You're honest. And I said, okay. all the computers went down. Honestly, every one of them. Every computer that they had went down. They could not fix it. And I felt like the Lord wanted me to pray. So I prayed. And they uh, started working. And I told my thing, I said, I was praying to ask the Lord to help them work. And he said, well, it must have worked because they all started working and they haven't <laughs> shut down. And I appreciate that. I appreciate the faithfulness of the Lord. Wherever I am, I want to be sure, a Christian. Sure. You know, it's different to come to church all the time and say your stuff. But, and I'm the only one like I am, and we all understand what that means. So, But I appreciate the Lord. Sure. And the girl I work with, she said, you know, she said, by the time this is done, she said, I don't think I'll ever curse again. She said, because I just don't feel comfortable saying anything bad around you. And I said, well, that's good. You know, that's good. But I appreciate the help sure. of the Lord. And I'm tired. Yes, I'm very tired. 12 hours a day when you've been retired for 12 or three years is a long time. <laughs> but the Lord has helped me. Sure. I told good. the Lord, I want to be alive wherever I am. Yes. And just working there for a little bit can make a difference in one person's sure. life and help them get to heaven. And that's what I want to do. But I thought of sitting here, we sing, he covers me there with his hand. He has certainly helped me. He has Good. certainly been with Praise me. Praise the Lord. There are a lot of different people there, and I think you know what I mean by that. And I just asked the Lord to help me to be friendly. And, sure. And, and this one lady, she said, you're the happiest person I know. And I said, <laughs> that's because I love Jesus. Yeah. And so I appreciate his help sure. and his mercy today. Amen. I'm thankful that with his help, we can be that light. We can be that influence. We can be that positive individual we need to be because we are to be that. We are to be little lights. We're to be Christians. We're to be godly examples in a very broken and fallen world. And he can help each of us do that. And I thank him. 
Amen. Anybody else want to give God praise today? Brother Joe? Pastor, I don't say a lot, but I'm glad the Lord is still involved in my life. Amen. Praise the Lord. I thank you, Lord. I thank you for the church. I thank you for the people. I want to say, too, I didn't get to stay long because I'd be home before dark, but it, it made my heart glad to see our young people. Yes. Enjoying themselves and having fun together. I really enjoy that, brother. I thank the Lord, though, that He's involved in my life. Amen. Praise the Lord. Amen. Aren't you thankful for that in your life? The same yesterday, today, and forever. Amen. I'm thankful for that. Praise the Lord. Anybody else? Angie? Isn't God good? Yes. Hey, Amen. He is. And God knows exactly what He's doing. And uh, He led you guys here. You're right. And the friendship those two young ladies have fostered in it has made all the difference. And I, God be praised. Yes. Amen. Yes. I'm thankful for that. Yes. God cares about all of our needs. And He cares about our friendships. And He cares about our dad. And He cares about our family. He cares. And so thankful for that reality today. Praise the Lord. Brother Mike. Yes. Of that, I pray you for all these promises and for the love he's done for yes. us. Amen. Amen. Good. of this church and really appreciate it for my sister and praise the Lord it came back like negative. Good. Yes. I don't know if he healed her or whatever but I just thank him for yes. his many blessings. Good. Praise the Lord. Amen. Amen. I'm thankful for the reminders that he then is all our hope and stay on Christ the solid rock yes. I can stand as I was driving to church this morning. I was praying and asking God I needed I just needed something extra and special today and a reminder. And those songs for the reminder I needed, he's there. He's just yes. 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 I can stand on his promises Amen. and I thank him this morning. Good. Amen. Praise the Lord. Amen. Amen. Anybody else want to testify this morning? Even if it's a minute and a verse, I pray all day and I thank you for the miracles that are happening in my life, in yes. my family's yes. life. I'm so grateful. I'm so unworthy. And God still loves me. His grace, his amazing grace. My verse is, my grace is sufficient for you. For and uh, you're uh, say it, Pastor. In my my strength is made perfect <laughs> in, in my weakness. I'm so weak. So old. <laughs> feel so. I can't make it to the picnic. My daughter was upset because I didn't make it. But I made it to church this morning anyway. Amen. And I praise Amen. God for 
saving me, for keeping me, for giving me the desire in my heart yes. to want to be with God's people. Yes. Praise Him. Praise the Lord for this church. I love you all. I appreciate you all. I pray for you all, and I hope you'll continue to pray for me. Sure. Absolutely. Absolutely. Let's sing that little chorus. We sing it often, but I want to sing that little chorus. God is so good. Hearing you guys testify, just, I'm thankful. He is so good. He answers prayer. I love him so. I'll do his will. Mean it when you sing it. God. family. They're in your bulletin. They're on the screen in front of you. And there's a whole host of others we don't even take the time to mention or we don't feel like we even can mention them. I was in a couple of community groups this week and heard needs that will probably never appear in this bulletin. It's one of the reasons why we do community groups because it gives you an opportunity to share needs in a small setting you would never do in a setting like this. I've walked away from couple of meetings this week of those community groups and I thought Lord what can we do and I've been reminded over and again he's able God is able God is able whatever need you have he's able he's able so why don't we just pray together let's give God praise maybe you can't stand and testify and it's just too much why don't you give God praise right where you're standing? I want Pastor Logan to come and lead us in prayer. I don't want him to do a monologue. I want you to pray. Let's lift our voices together and give God praise this morning. Pastor, come and lead us in prayer. Let's go to our Heavenly Father this morning. Your Father, therefore, since we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession. For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who has been tempted in all things as we are, yet without sin. Therefore, let us draw near with confidence to the throne of grace, so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. In Jesus, it was you who came down who died for our sins, who rose on the third day, and you brought us from the kingdom of darkness, and you've transferred us, as Paul says, to the kingdom of light. And so we come to you as our Redeemer. We come to you, and we confess that we need you this morning. We come to you, and we know that you hear us, and so we bring you the things that make us weary. We bring you the things that make us heavy laden. Lord, there are those here this morning who are, who are going through it, who don't understand what's happening in their lives and don't understand the trials. But Lord, your strength is made perfect in weakness. Your grace is sufficient for us. Your power is perfected in weakness. Paul says, most gladly, therefore, I will rather boast about my weaknesses so that the power of Christ may dwell in me. Lord, let us be content 
with weaknesses, with insults, with distresses, with persecutions, with difficulties. For, for your sake, for when we are weak, we are strong. Lord, help us today. We don't want to just be here and hear a prayer and sing songs and hear a sermon. Lord, we want to be revived. We are here to hear from you. We're here for a reason and you brought us here. Lord, help us to bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. Lord, I pray for each and every person here this morning. Lord, we bring you the things in our church, our needs. We pray for Avis Blowers. We pray for Sharon, Sheila's sister, and for Angie's dad, David. Lord, we also pray for a friend at GBS whose friend was shot and killed two nights ago. We pray for the Bradley family tonight as they are struggling to maybe realize what, what, the, what the purpose was of this and what's happening in their lives. But Lord, I pray your grace and your strength around them today. I pray you would, you would help them realize in this time that you are the one to cling to, that you are the rock, that you are the fortress. Lord, I pray for our, our country today, Lord. We need your help. Lord, humble us this morning. Humble us as a country to kneel before you to repent. Lord, help our election, help our president, help our system. Lord, we need you so much. Lord, help your will. Lord, let your will go forth in our country. Push back the forces of evil that want to do us harm. Push back the forces of darkness that want to blind us. And Lord, let righteousness go forth, not just in our country, but in this church. Lord, we pray for this church. We pray for this ministry, that you would be the... You would be the only reason we do what we do. Lord, help us to realize it's not about us. It's not about how good we sound or how good we preach or how good we sing. But Lord, it's about you. It's about giving worship and praise to you. So enable us. Help us to do that this morning. As we bring you our needs, help us to worship you. Help us to trust you. We we'll also pray for Tim and Chris who are getting moved this week. We we'll pray for our unspoken needs, Lord. So many people who haven't voiced the needs of their heart. And so we pray for one another. We pray that your grace, that your peace would rule our hearts in everything that we say and do, in all our interactions, everything that we do, Jesus. We ask that you be glorified in you alone. Everything we say, everything we do in this service, Lord, let it be glorifying to you. And it's in the name of the only Savior, Jesus Christ, we pray these things. Amen. You may be seated. Water 
Overcome the raging sea But I know a man who can I can't cause blind eyes to open Or make the lame to walk again Thank you, Herring family, so very much for a wonderful truth and reminder. There's a lot of things in life I cannot do. I had a plumbing catastrophe this week. Was that funny, Meryl? <laughs> God did not gift me with the ability to do certain things. I'm not good at building things. I'm not good at putting my vehicle together. I'm good at taking things apart. I'm good at unclogging things, Merrill. But I failed at looking at that full sink and thinking, if I unhook this, all of that must go down and out. Somewhere, do I need to finish the story? <laughs> yeah, uh-huh. yeah, I do, don't I? <laughs> Garbage disposal is full. I took things apart. I started pulling stuff out and slowly but surely, and then all of a sudden, (laughs) I mean, water just came flying out of that pipe all over the place. I don't know, three or four gallons. It was a bunch. It was a bunch of water. And Merrill found out yesterday, and he just thought that was the funniest thing ever. And now I've told you and anyone else who's watching, you're welcome. (laughs) There's a lot of things I cannot do. Can't put a life back together. I wish I could. I wish I could wave my little stubby finger in your life and just fix it. I wish I could put families together. I wish I could fix financial chaos. I wish I could give jobs when they're needed. I wish I could do so many things. But I can't. But I know one who can I know one who's able just to speak, and it fixes everything. I know one who's able to just be there, and it make all the difference in the world. And I can't explain that. I don't understand it. I wish I did. But all I know is that there's the God-man Jesus Christ And he makes all things new. He changes everything. That song that I've been reminded of from time to time says the gospel changes everything and it's changing me. The gospel fixes everything. 
And that song goes right in line with what I want to preach on this morning. So thank you, Herring family, for that wonderful song. The book of Exodus chapter 3 is where I want us to look this morning. Exodus chapter 3. Again, huge thank you to those of you that were there yesterday. Really meant a lot to just be together. Perfect weather. And uh, had a great time eating and spending time together around the fire and watching kids run around and flip and fall and jump and springboard off the bounce house and ride the horse. That was awesome. And one, I don't remember which, uh, Aubrey. Aubrey came flying across the yard. And when I say flying, I mean limping. And she messed her leg up or something. And I said, what are you doing? She says, I just rode a horse. And she just made her a whole day. And uh, so thank you for those of you that are here, and I trust that you had a good time. Exodus chapter 3, and I'm going to give you some background information before we actually read uh, God's Word this morning. Um, as we look at this exact portion of Scripture and this, this little blip on the, the radar or the, the timeline of the history of the children of Israel, I mean, it's really unfair just to look at a few verses and just go. And yet, I don't have the time to recall decades and probably at least two centuries of infra. I don't have time to do that either. But I've got to give you some sort of cliff note so you have some sort of an appreciation or at least an understanding of what we're looking at this morning. I mean, I really need to start in Genesis chapter 37. And if you know where Genesis ends, that's chapter 50. And I'm looking at Exodus 3. Lord have mercy. We'll be here forever. But it's raining, so you can't, you don't want to leave anyway. So um, I've got a lot of ground to cover, so I'm trying to tell you. I got 16 chapters to cover. We could and really should start in Genesis 37. We should really begin where we look at the life of Joseph. But we're going to fast forward as quickly as absolutely possible where Joseph is. Well, he's the beloved in his family, and his brothers hate his guts. I mean, they do. They despise him. And Joseph, let me be very clear, Joseph didn't help himself. Hey, guys, I had a dream, and you're all in it. And you all bow to me. That didn't go over well. If you have a good relationship with your siblings, don't do that. It's not going to end well. And it didn't go any better when he looked at his dad and said, Hey, I think you and mom are in it too. That didn't, that didn't make matters any better. So Joseph slowed, sold into slavery. Parent, or his kids, or his siblings, rather, wanted to kill him. And one had the bright idea, let's not kill him. Let's just throw him in a deep, dark pit, and then we'll sell him. Well, that's exactly what happens. And he is sold to, eat, to, to the Egyptians. And the next thing you know, he rises to, to, to fame. And then he falls down, and, and he goes in the pit of despair in a dungeon. And he's, he's just got to be wrestling with himself. Lord, what in the world is going on? I had these dreams, and you give me dreams, and I'm sold into slavery, and I have this power and authority in Potiphar's house, and then she lies, and here I am in jail. I mean, Joseph's life is an absolute roller coaster. Eventually, suffice it to say, Joseph rises to power again. He's the second most powerful man in all of Egypt behind Pharaoh himself. And, and wouldn't you know it, Joseph is able to move his entire family to Egypt with him. And, and God was able to help Joseph and give him wisdom and in interpreting dreams and putting a plan of action in place. And really, he spared the entire people of Egypt. But Joseph passes away. His family, no doubt, passes away. And Pharaoh passes away. And Scripture tells us that a new Pharaoh comes to reign and rule, and he doesn't know Joseph, and he doesn't know Joseph's God. And that Pharaoh has a complex. He's power hungry, and he wants it all to himself. He doesn't know Joseph, doesn't really care about his past, doesn't really care about the history of, of this Jehovah. He really doesn't care. It's all about him. And so what does he do? He creates a law. He creates a decree that every male baby that is born of the Hebrews, they are to be killed. I mean, that's when you know you have issues, right? He's scared to death that all these people are going to rise up in, in strength and in numbers and overthrow, overthrow himself and the entire Egyptian people. And so he says, I know what I'll do. I'll fix everything. We'll just kill the newborn baby boys. And along comes Moses. We're in Exodus, by the way, now. See how fast we're moving? Don't you wish I preached like this? Thank you, Mary. I knew someone would say yes. Moses comes along, and his mother hides him as absolutely long as possible. 
until she's no longer to keep him quiet. Puts him in a basket. You know the story. Floats him down the Nile River. Again, cutting out a lot of information, but Moses is eventually raised and reared in the palace. The finest of education, the finest of all things of science and politics and medicine. I mean, all those things, I mean, we're, we're, I know we're reading a lot in the scripture. I understand that. But I mean, Moses had to have the very best of opportunities in his life. And then Moses does something absolutely foolish. He's 40 years old. I mean, he never should have been given life. Now he's 40. He sees an Egyptian and a Hebrew fighting. And what does he do? He looks one way and then he looks the other and he kills the Egyptian. And he thought he got away with it and he buried him in the sand. And, and, and some time later, he sees two more people fighting. And hey, hey, break it up, break it up. And one pipes off a rather smart aleck comment and says, what are you going to do if we don't? Kill us? I mean, that's what you did the other time. And Moses runs for the backside of the desert. 40 years old, takes off running, finds a wife, begins herding sheep. He's a shepherd now. And for 40 long years, he's on the backside of the desert. That's the context of this morning's message. The context is slavery for the Egyptian or for the uh, children of Israel, bondage, cruelty. And then here's Moses on the backside of the desert. Stand with me, please, as we read God's word. Now Moses kept the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian, and he led the flock to the backside of the desert and came to the mountain of God, even to Horeb. And the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a flame of fire out of the midst of a bush. And he looked, and behold, the bush burned with fire, and the bush was not consumed. And Moses said, I will now turn aside and see this great sight, why the bush is not burnt. And when the Lord saw that he turned aside to see, God called unto him out of the midst of the bush and said, Moses, Moses. And he said, Here am I. And he said, Draw not nigh hither, put off thy shoes from off thy feet, for the place whereon thou standest is holy ground. Moreover, he said, I am the God of thy father, and the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face, and he was afraid to look upon God. And the Lord said, I have surely seen the affliction of my people, which are in Egypt, and I've heard their cry by reason of their taskmasters, for I know their sorrows, and I am come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians, and to bring them up out of that land, and into a good land, a large land, flowing with milk and honey, unto the place of the Canaanites, and the Hittites, and the Amorites, and the Perizzites, and the Hivites, and the Jebusites. And now, therefore, behold, the cry of the children of Israel is come unto me. And I have also seen the oppression wherewith the Egyptians oppressed them. Come now, therefore, and I will send thee unto Pharaoh, that you may bring forth my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. And Moses said unto God, Who am I? Who am I that I should go unto Pharaoh, and that I should bring forth the children of Israel out of Egypt? And God said, Certainly I will be with thee, and this shall be a token unto thee that I have sent thee. When thou hast brought forth the people out of Egypt, you shall serve God upon this mountain. I want to try to talk to you this morning about this phrase I've already alluded to and the song the herring's just saying, God is able. Yes, Father, you're here this morning. You've touched our hearts. Our minds are quickened. We're ready to receive your word. Make it easy to preach. Make it easy to listen. Make it easy to move in your direction when you move in ours. We ask and pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Oftentimes when we hear stories of the children of Israel, we cast blame rather quickly. At least I do. I hear stories of the children of Israel and I think, my goodness, how hard could it be to just trust and obey what God said? Do this, I'll bless you. Don't do this. Do this and you'll be cursed. Don't do this. I mean, over and over again, we see the children of Israel suffering in sin and we see a generation cast aside and we see the fiery serpent that killed many. I mean, we see things over and over and over. They're sold into bondage and redeemed and sold into slavery and redeemed. I mean, the whole history of the children of Israel is quite depressing. It's maddening. It's aggravating. But this time it's different. It's not the children of Israel's fault this time. 
This time it was somebody else. This time it was somebody else's poor decisions and bad choices. This time it was somebody who rose to power and fame and said, no, not today, not Jehovah, not whoever that is or whatever that is. I'm Pharaoh. I'm the king. I'm in charge. I just gave you that context and that history, but we'll just remind you again that this Pharaoh did not care about Joseph, his past, his memory, his heritage. He didn't care about his family. He didn't care about any of that. It was as if Pharaoh was saying, I'm the man. I'll do things how I want to do them. I'm in charge. I want the glory. I want the fame. I want the prestige and the honor. And whoever this Hebrew thing is, I don't want anything to do with it. And unfortunately for that Pharaoh, we actually remember him. He made a name for himself, didn't he? For it was his son that was taken in that tenth and final plague. We remember that Pharaoh. Oh, he made a name for himself, all right. Pride, arrogance, haughtiness. Oh, he, we remember him, but not as, not as he wanted us to remember him. I mean, we think of this very brief and condensed history of the children of Israel that I've given to you. We think about the very short history of Moses. And I think it's important to understand that in in, in light of the discouragement and the enslavement, in spite of the sin that Moses had committed, I think it's very important to understand this morning that God was never at one single time done with the children of Israel, and he never was done with Moses. In spite of sin, in spite of chaos, in spite of circumstances and confusion, God was never done with Moses. And in spite of enslavement by somebody else, God was never done with the children of Israel. God has always had a plan. He's always had a purpose. He's always had a people. God has always been the provider of everyone who has ever had a need. And we can go all the way back to nearly the beginning of Scripture and see that it is so. God's plan has never been ruined. God's power has never been thwarted. God's ability has never been diminished. God has never been caught off guard. He's never wrung his hands in confusion and doubt and wonder. But again and again and again, the the same God of yesterday is the God of today and will be the God of forever. And he does not change, regardless of who's in power, regardless of who's making decisions, regardless of your circumstances. He stands still true, tall, strong, and mighty to deliver. He is God this morning and he doesn't change. Specifically, I want to notice that for this passage of Scripture in verses 7 and 8. I read 12 verses, but I really want to focus on these two verses, verses 7 and 8. And want to look at the, at the plan or the hope or the, the, really the, the, the hope that God gave to Moses. Number one, we see God's words. I have seen the affliction of my people. No doubt while Joseph was, was alive, living in Egypt wasn't too bad. I have a feeling things are relatively peaceful and quiet and pretty good. I mean, after all, you have to understand Joseph's number two in command. I just have a feeling they could worship how they wanted to, live how they wanted to, flocks and herds and land. and I mean, they could just do whatever they wanted to do, pagan society and culture, and yet they lived within that context. And I just have a feeling everything just kind of worked. Sound familiar? You can tell me we live in a Christian nation. I'm not going to argue with you, but the longer I'm here and the more news I'm watching, the more I'm really wondering and questioning. Joseph and his family and his people are given respect. Freedom. Worship. Family. Oh, they have to abide by the law of the land, but don't we all have to? (laughs) Nothing was different for Joseph, I'm sure, until Pharaoh and Joseph pass on. Now there's a growing mindset and belief and attitude that the children of Israel might become more popular and more powerful and more populated. And to be fair, I I could understand that. I could understand how a sitting individual of power and authority would look on at maybe hundreds of thousands of people and think, You know what? If if things change a little bit, I could be in trouble. I mean, I could understand how a fellow would come to that conclusion. But slavery wasn't the answer, wasn't the right answer. And certainly murder wasn't the alternative either. And Pharaoh, this guy, chose both. (laughs) He enslaved these people and made them work long, laborious hours. And he made life miserable and tough and difficult. 
You think about that this morning. Do this and go there and do that and hurry up and beaten with whips and long hours and no pay. Sound like where you work? I'm joking. Maybe. (laughs) Awful conditions. Awful work environment. Terrible way to live. Terrible way to make a living. Terrible way to raise a family. And if I'm living and working in that environment, even as a Hebrew, I think I sit back at night and I, and I scratch my head and I, I put salve on the boils in the bottom of my feet and I think, now, Lord, are you really alive and well? Because I can remember Joseph. I, re- I mean, I'm, I'm old enough. I remember him. Lord, I remember your hand upon us. I remember the provision you gave us. And we've not moved. We've not changed. We've not done anything. And yet we're in bondage now. Lord, I remember back then, are you still alive and well today? I think it was absolutely plausible there were those who asked those questions. I mean, wouldn't you be asking? Wouldn't you be wondering, where is God? This doesn't add up. Something doesn't make sense. Does he not understand? Does he not see what I'm going through? And yet as Moses is 40 years far removed from that situation, he's standing in front of that fiery bush that is lit up and not consumed. And he hears God say these words, Behold, I have seen the affliction of my people which are in Egypt. And friends, I want to encourage you this morning by telling you, God sees you where you are today. He has seen you. He has always seen you from eternity past to right now to eternity in the future. God sees you this very second. Nodding off, asleep, or wide awake and attentive, or daydreaming a thousand miles away, He sees you right here this morning. And we can look back at the children of Israel this particular time and endeavor to make comparisons, and I hope none of us are being enslaved and beaten. None of us are likely going through the torment the children of Israel went through. And while I certainly don't know everything about your life and what you're currently going through, I know God well enough, and I know His Word well enough to say with confidence, God sees exactly what you are going through. The pastor may not see, and the pastor may not know, and the pastor may not understand, and quite frankly, nobody else may see or know or understand. But I'm reminding you of an invaluable truth, Christian. God sees you. It might be at your job. I don't know the co-workers. I don't know your boss, your employees. I don't know what you have to wrestle with. Maybe that's where the problem is. Maybe it's a family member and it's just, boy, it's just a wreck. Maybe it's a situation that nobody knows anything about. Your friends don't know. Your family doesn't know. Your parents don't know. Your kids don't know. Nobody knows. It's just you and the Lord and you feel like half the time he doesn't even know. I want you to know this morning, God does see and God does know. Just because we don't see it, and just because we don't understand it, and just because I don't have answers and you don't have answers doesn't mean that we just throw our hands up and say, well, I guess it's just not worth it anymore. No. God sees. God has answers. God is able. He knows the struggle in your heart. He knows the struggle in your mind. He knows the ailments within your body. He knows your soul. He knows your burdens. Take confidence this morning, friend. God sees you. Psalm 139, and I'm going to read the entire chapter, and I know it's several verses, but it's, I don't know what you cut out. O Lord, Thou hast searched me and known me. You know my down-sitting and mine uprising. You understand my thoughts afar off. You comprehend my path around er, and my lying down and are acquainted with all my ways. For there is not a word in my tongue, but lo, O Lord, You know it all together. You have beset me behind and before and laid your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is high and I cannot attend unto it. Where shall I go from thy spirit or where shall I flee from thy presence? If I send up into heaven, you are there. If I should make my bed in hell, behold, you are there. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there shall thy hand lead me and thy right hand shall hold me. If I say, surely the darkness shall cover me, even the night shall be light about me. Yea, the darkness hideth not from thee, but the light shineth as the day. The darkness and the light are both alike to thee. For thou hast possessed my reins, you have covered me in my mother's womb. I will praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are your works, and that my soul knoweth right well. 
My substance was not hid from you when I was made in secret and curiously wrought in lowest parts of the earth. Thine eyes did see my substance, yet being imperfect, and in thy book all my members were written, which in continuance were fashioned, when as yet there was none of them. How precious also are your thoughts unto me, O God! How great is the sum of them! If I should count them, they are more in number than the sand. When I awake, I am still with thee. Christian, be encouraged today. He sees you. He knows your thoughts. He knows your down sitting, your uprising. He knows exactly where you are. And the children of Israel didn't have that luxury like you and I have it today. They didn't have that psalm and that truth. They didn't have that little nugget of inspiration. We do. Thank God we do. I mean, we have the entirety of his word. They didn't have this. All the more confident we should be that our God sits upon the throne in heaven and he looks down upon us and he loves us because he sees us. In every situation, in every circumstance, in every battle, in every failure, in every valley, in every emotion, in every anxiety, everywhere, in all places, with all people, He sees you. Praise His name. But God did more than just see. Secondly, I notice God said, I have heard their cry. You think the children of Israel ever complained? Oh my goodness. Was their besetting sin many times? Grumblers and gripers and complainers. You don't know any, do you? Yeah, me neither. God help us. Every time the children of Israel turn around, they complain about something. Well, we don't have anything to eat. We don't have anything to drink. Well, we don't have this. So I wish we were back in Egypt. It was better there. But do you think the children of Israel ever complained about where they're at right now? I mean, they had freedom, and now they have bondage. Ironic, isn't it? That just, you know, a few months, a few years later, they would be complaining because they had freedom and they, and they wanted bondage. They're a head case. Can't figure the children of Israel out. But right now, they're frustrated, I'm sure, because they're in bondage when they had freedom. <laughs> you think it ever frustrated them to the point they cried out to God in agony? From freedom to slavery, from landowners to having it stripped away, from freedom of worship to being forced to worship pagan idols, from peace and prosperity to chaos and defeat. And now we're taking it a step further. No one thought that would happen, but certainly not this, which the male newborns are now murdered at birth. I mean, you think about that. Parents, or soon-to-be parents, who may have prayed earnestly, to have children, are now praying earnestly not to have a male child. This is the new law. The law of hatred and of murder. What cries must have went up to heaven from parents who had their doors kicked in and homes ravaged, throwing things upside down and ripping apart everything just to hear the cry of an infant to see if it was a boy. The pride in a father's eyes and in his face as he holds that newborn son only to have a, a, an, a, an unprepared scream. And moments later, the door burst open and that child no longer in yours. What anguish God must have heard from his people. Yes. What cries of desperation. And I hope we never experience anything like that here in America. I would like to ask you a question without you answering. Have you ever cried out to God before? Have you ever just kind of looked up and said, Lord, what in the world's going on? It may not have been as graphic as what I just explained to you, having a child ripped from your arms. I don't know, maybe it was something similar, maybe different altogether. Have you ever gone through a situation and wondered if God heard you? Maybe you've never wondered if God saw you. Maybe you've not wrestled with that. He's in heaven, He looks down, He creates, He sees me. Maybe that's not been the struggle. Maybe the struggle is over 7 billion voices and God can pinpoint yours. 
Maybe that's the struggle. Does God really hear me? I've struggled with that personally. Lord, I mean, you suspend the galaxies and you hear me? I don't know about you, and maybe you're in the same boat that I've been in before. Maybe you know with confidence and assurance that God sees you in your need, but maybe you're struggling with the reality that God also hears your cry. Lord, I need wisdom. Lord, I need counsel. Lord, I need guidance. Lord, I need help. <laughs> I need answers. I need you. Admittedly, I've not been through a whole terrible amount of life. But I've been through just enough, just a few times, to understand there were times that no one knew but Jesus. And even if I could relay it and put it into words, which I just, it's no shocker, I have the ability to talk. And sometimes I don't. And God understands that too. There's been times, even if I could formulate my very best thoughts and, and, and articulate all my words and just spill them out to you, you just stare at me like, well, what are you talking about? I can't help you. There's been times I've cried out to God and I thought, Lord, you've got to be the only one that can handle what I'm giving you. My, my wife doesn't understand, my kids, my friends, my family, my job, my church. Nobody gets it. It's going to have to be you. And even in those moments, with great confidence, I can tell you, God has always seen my need and he's always heard my cry for help. Listen to the psalmist who said this, I sought the Lord and he heard me and he delivered me from all of my fears. This poor man, the psalmist said, cried and the Lord heard him and saved him out of all his troubles. Friends, admittedly, I don't know all of what you're going through. I don't know what everybody, I don't know the trials. I don't know the situation. And even if I did, I probably couldn't fully understand it. I can't comprehend some of the pain and the agony and the trials and heartaches. But I know a man who can. I know one who can. I know one who can see and who can hear. I know one that has seen and has heard. I know one this morning whose ear is in tune with your voice. And he knows when you cry. He knows when you lament. He knows when you just lay helpless on the couch and you have nothing to say and nothing to offer. He sees it and he hears it. I thought just this week of the... And I'm going to butcher it because I didn't look it up. But the lady in the scripture, and she just simply had one cry, Lord, help me. Three words. If you don't know what to pray, there's your prayer. Lord, help me. God sees and he hears, but we're taking it to a third step and a little bit further. God said, I know their sorrows. You know, there's something unique about someone else knowing what we're going through. I appreciate that. I really do. I've been there. I've walked that valley. I've, I've experienced. And this is what I did to get through it. Well, I appreciate that, don't you? Someone else who's been through the valley and they see you going through it and they say, you know what? I've been there and this is what I did. And I'm not saying it's foolproof, but give it a shot. I wish I'd have thought of that when I flooded the kitchen the other day. But I didn't, Merrill. I didn't think about it. But you know, there's something significant about getting through the other side and looking back and saying, he helped me and she was there and he sent a text and she called. And but you know what? God was there every step of the way. And then to be still looking at that deep, dark valley and see somebody else coming down from the mountaintop. And what an obligation you and I have, Christian. What a responsibility we have, church, to go running back into the valley of darkness and say, hey, I've done this, and you can make it. Yes, sir. Yes. And to pull along some, alongside somebody and put your arm around them and maybe not say a blessed word, but you just clear the wax out of your ear and you listen. And you say, I'll be a friend, cry on my shoulder. I'll be a friend, I won't say a word. I just want to be here for you. 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 3 and 4. Blessed be God, even the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and the God of all comfort. Verse 4, listen carefully. Who comforteth 
us in all our tribulation that we may be able to comfort them which are in any trouble by the comfort wherewith we ourselves are comforted of God. I'm not saying that's a one-off on why bad things happen to good people. I'm not saying that. But boy, I have found a lot of help in that fourth verse. In other words, when you look at someone else go through their trials, <laughs> go ahead and comfort them. You've been there. When someone else goes through the valley, help them out. Grab your little light and shine it. Be their friend. Because you made it with God's help, and they can too. One of my best friends had a brain tumor removed a few years ago when Beth and I were pastoring in Georgia. He was diagnosed before we got there, and while we were there, he made the decision to have the operation, have that tumor removed. And it cut him from the side of his head all the way to the back and all the way up to the top. It just looks like a horseshoe right on the side of his head. Uh, some 50-plus staples, I think. And you have to understand, when you go through something like that, anytime you deal with the, this is just me, <laughs> the brain in the back, I get nervous real quick. I just do. So when the doctor and the surgeon sits you down and very casually, almost with great calluses on his emotions, says, well, pretty good success rate, but if I twitch, all these things can go wrong. You may never walk again, or you might limp, and you might not be able to play basketball, and you may not be able to do this. And You have to understand, I'm three days older than this fella, and we hunted together, and we live life together. I mean, we, you know, we're, we still are good friends. And you can understand when somebody's your age and they get that kind of potential news, how that can just, well, that's a big pill to swallow. But we practiced what we preached and we trust in the Lord with all of our hearts and didn't lean on our own understanding. And we said, Lord, he's yours. Long story short, the surgery was a tremendous success. And to this day, there is just a, you wouldn't notice it, but there's just a real, just minute, probably forever, that he'll, he'll always have with him issue with his foot. And you probably can't even tell it. Several weeks after that, Channing is doing quite well. And all of a sudden, he, he said this to me. He said, hey, he said, a friend of a friend, I don't even remember, the, I don't remember how all the connection was made, but... A young man, younger than us, same thing. And he said, Channing said, you, you want to go to Atlanta with me and be there with that family and maybe you could pray with them? Well, who are they again? I don't know who they are. I heard about somebody on Facebook. Somebody said, blah, blah, blah. I said, sure. Yeah, let's go. So we found out the date of the surgery and we showed up. And we, I mean, we don't know these people from Adam's house cat. I'm serious. We, I don't have a clue who they are. They don't know who we are. We don't know each other. We got to the, to the desk, information desk, and looking for so-and-so. No problem. That's right down here, and there we went. I mean, we, when we walk in the triage, I mean, it's just kind of weird. Who are you guys? You don't look like chaplains. Well, at least not both of you. And Channing just told him, I've been in that bed. Different surgeon, different procedure, same thing. I've had brain surgery. And I want you to know that the scar right here, God's been good to me. And this is my pastor, and we just want to have a quick word of prayer. That's living out first that 2 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 4. Comforting others as they go through the trials, being there for others when they go through adversity. Sometimes life isn't about you. <laughs> Fact is, let me just tell you, it's not. <laughs> it's for you to help somebody else. Sometimes it's about helping somebody else make it. When they go in their deep road or their dark road and their deep valley, it's for you to make sure they make it. And yet as awesome and as humbling as it is to be able to help somebody in those situations, it's an even greater comfort to know that we have a Savior 
who we can turn to for leadership and guidance. I mean, I'm absolutely humbled. I'm humbled when God places someone in my life that I can help. I mean, it's just kind of blows my mind sometimes. And then I enjoy helping people. That's part of why I do what I do. But the flip side of the coin is I enjoy when others help me. But the help you give me and the hope I help, I hope that I give you pales in comparison to the help that God gives us for he knows our sorrows. He knows our anxieties. He knows our burdens just like he knew the sorrows of the children of Israel. He knows our sorrows just like he did for Daniel and just like he did for David and Shadrach and Meshach and Abednego and Esther and Peter and Paul and on and on and on it goes. Our God knows our sorrow. He's almighty. He's omnipresent. He's omniscient. He is the divine being that we worship today. He sees. He understands. He hears. He knows our sorrows. And friends, regardless of what you're going through this morning, God sees you in your situation. Regardless of how long you've been praying for the Lord's help, He has heard you from prayer number one. And I promise you, on the authority of God's word, He still is attentive to your cry. He knows your need this morning. He knows your sorrows. He knows your pain. He's acquainted with our struggle and our griefs. He's all too aware of the sorrow that you're going through. But what's more than that and most important perhaps is that God said, I know all of these things and I am come down to deliver them. Well, it's one thing for God to see, hear, and know. I appreciate that. But then to know that God has the ability to do something about it. He's able this morning. We're still preaching about God is able. He's able to reach into hearts and lives of those you're praying for who are on their way to an eternal devil's hell. He's able for them this morning. Don't you dare give up. Don't you ever quit. I don't care how dark the night and I don't care how insurmountable it looks and I don't care how much victory Satan's winning in their life. Don't you ever quit. To those that are struggling physically, Jesus spent a good bit of his ministry helping those that were physically handicapped and frustrated and broken. It may be something small to me, but it might be something big to you. God's able for your physical need. I'm not a name it claim. I'm not a radical charismatic, but I believe that the God of the scriptures, the God of today. And if you've got a physical, I believe God can help you. I just do. I believe God's able to bring healing and restoration to broken relationships. I believe that with all my heart. In your home and at your workplace and in the church, He's able to just pull people together. He's able. It doesn't have to be in the same family. It can be friends. It can be at the, your co-workers. God has the ability to, sh- to break down all the barriers and all the confusion and dissipate all the clouds and bring the glorious sunlight of the gospel into your situation and bring healing and restoration. He's able today. He's able to touch the minds of the feeble and the frail. He's able to quicken your mind. He's able to give wisdom to the simplistic. He's able to supply financial needs. He's able to fix issues at work. He's able to give you peace and anxiety and calmness to your nerves, fears and apprehensions. He's able, Paul said, to do exceedingly, abundantly, above all that we could ask or think. He is able. He's able to do something about it. Do you believe that today? Yes, sir. I mean, do you really? The same God who said, I am come down to deliver them. He was there for Abraham. He promised Abraham and Sarah a son. God promised Abraham would be the father of many nations. And Abraham just packs up and starts walking. I, I don't think I'll ever understand that this side of eternity. I really don't. And if you've got it figured out, you're smarter than I am. Abraham just leaves everything behind. Family of just everything. Where are we going, Lord? I'll tell you when you get there. Okay. Which way do I walk? Ah, That way looks good. (laughs) Okay. And through every trial and every adversity and every pit stop Abraham made, God was faithful. 
and he delivered to Abraham time and time again. And then, and then he was there for Isaac. The son of Abraham was to be offered as a sacrifice. Again, you understand that? Come help me. Well, that's a picture of the, that's a picture of the things to come with God and Jesus Christ. Abraham didn't know that. <laughs> that's his promised son. He's going to bind him up and lay him on, his, on the altar and kill him. And yet there's a ram caught in a thicket, and God provided again. Yes, sir. And God was there for Jacob, a man who betrayed Isaac, his father, a man who was hated by Esau, a man loved by his mother more than his father, and throughout life, betrayal and animosity and adversity. And, and then he gets in a wrestling match with God, and it changed his whole life. Walked with a limp the rest of his days, and yet it was what... Jacob needed to give everything to God, and he surrendered everything. A changed man for God's purpose and his will to accomplish God's desire, and he was different. And then from Jacob to Joseph, and we just barely, barely mention God's faithfulness to Joseph. And God's trust in Joseph, and then we see the, un, the ultimately the, the, the Moses and the children of Israel. And again, time doesn't allow to look at all the faithfulness of God through the children of Israel, but it's safe to say, if God was able for Abraham... Isaac and Jacob and Joseph and Moses and Joshua and the entire children of Israel, then surely God is there for you and me and our needs. I mean, he, if He was able for them, if He was able and come down to deliver all those individuals I just named and generations of problems and issues and chaos and, and adversity, if the same God who is able to come down and deliver them, surely He can deliver you this morning. He's not a God that sits up high in heaven upon his throne and just looks down with laughter and glee at all your issues. That's not God. But Isaiah 53 paints a very different view of the Savior, that he is acquainted with our griefs. Man of sorrows, the songwriter said, what a name. I mean, just think about Jesus Christ bearing in his body our sorrows and our oppressions and our anxieties. And God says, I am come down to deliver them. And I don't know how God's going to do that for you. I don't know. And I, I'm not a charismatic person. I just is not. This stuff makes me nervous. It just does. And yet on the authority of God's word, he can deliver you. And that's what I want to leave you with. The reminder that God is able to deliver you. Whatever it is you're facing, He can guide you. Whatever it is you're battling, He can set you free. Whatever it is you're coming up against, God can make your path straight and plain and easy to walk in with His help and by His grace. But don't take it from me. Read God's Word. Reflect on what God did for the children of Israel. We're not even looking at the plagues and all the deliver. We're not even looking at that today. But I will just tell you enough that that's exactly what happened and God kept His Word. Yeah. <laughs> and all these people come through the plagues and Pharaoh just says, get out of here and just go. I don't care. Just go. Take all you want. Take what we have. Just go. Cross through the Red Sea and on and on the story goes. Oh, God doesn't just make a promise. He keeps it. Yes, sir. And he'll keep his word to you because he's never broken his word yet and he's not going to. <laughs> he's never left anyone <clears throat> who's committed their life to him. God's invested too much in you when he sent his son Jesus Christ to die on a cross. He invested too much to watch you walk away. He's not going to give up on you. So if you're struggling this morning, be encouraged with the fact that God sees you. Be encouraged that God sees exactly where you're living. Everyone around you might think you're okay and life is a better rose, but on the inside, maybe you're an absolute wreck. God sees that and He's able to deliver you. Maybe I'm speaking to someone who has prayed and cried and prayed and cried and you have nothing left to give to the Lord. And your question to God is, do you really see me? Do you really hear me? Do you really care? And I'll just point you to what Jesus said, cast all your cares upon me. Is that where he ended it? Nope. Why? Because I care for you.
Let me just tell you something. There's no promise in Scripture that God makes that He doesn't mean. I know, that's real deep. That is true. Read His Word. There's no promise that God makes that He doesn't keep. And if He said, cast all your cares on me because I care for you, He means it. And He cares for you. Friends, I want you to know today, whatever it is you're facing, He's able. I can't put a life back together again. I can't fix a soul that sin sick. I can't do any of those things. But I know a man who can. Stand with me, please, this morning. I want you to bow your head and close your eyes. We're not going to play anything on the piano. We're not going to sing. I just feel like I need to open the altar for just a moment. I've heard the statement several times before service started this morning. Well, the devil's fighting today. (laughs) Yeah, he is. But he's not the only one fighting. God is too. Don't ever forget that. And this morning, they're both fighting for you. The devil came to steal, to kill, and to destroy. In that same verse, Jesus went on to say, John 10, 10, But I have come, that they might have life and have it more abundantly. There's a war going on in this world that the world doesn't know anything about. And maybe right now you say, Pastor, I just need to pray. I I just need to come out and I just need to spend some time with the Lord. I've got all the time for you today. I'm not asking about sin and salvation. I'm just simply saying, do you have a need? And is it to the point where you just want to come and pray and say, Pastor at church, would you pray for me? I didn't have it in my notes to do it, but I feel very prompted. I know some of you are going through a lot. And I know some of you are going through things I can't even relate to. But there's a God in heaven who has seen the affliction of His people. He hears your cry. He knows your sorrow. And He can and is able to come down and deliver you. Father in heaven, we're pausing for a moment. We're so thankful for your word and your truth. It impacts our lives at every juncture, at every intersection, at every moment. No other book, no other truth affects us like your word. It's not because of the preacher, it's because it's your word. And Lord, I pray today that wherever we may be in this sanctuary or wherever and at whatever time someone may be watching this, maybe later in the week, May that one that needs reminded know (laughs) that you're there for them. And when we walk out of this sanctuary, we understand life isn't just fixed. But there's the perspective that we need change, that you see us, you hear us, you know us, and you're able to deliver. So that one that's in bondage this morning, I pray that they would know all those things to be true. That home, that family, that situation, that person you know. Oh, Lord, you know. And so go and help and intervene and impact as only you're able to do. And Father, for what you do for us, we would give you the praise for it. For we ask these things in Jesus' name. And everyone said, amen. Lord bless you. You're dismissed.